is week five of our study. That means we are halfway through this study. It's just flying by. And so far we've said that God is holy, he's loving, he's good, and he's just. And today we're going to talk about that he is merciful. And I laughed this week as I was planning it and was texting with Rebecca and Tricia, and Rebecca said, I was hiding behind the door when he handed out the mercy gifts. And so, <laughs> which I disagree, she is very merciful, but I thought that was really funny. Um, but just like we have with the other attributes, we're going to start off by talking about what is mercy, and then we're going to talk about how God is merciful, and then we'll end our time by talking about how we can reflect his mercy to others. All right, well, let me pray and we'll dive in. Heavenly Father, I just thank you so much for this night. Thank you for these women that are gathered. And Lord, just thank you for your word that tells us who you are, that tells us about your mercy. And Lord, I just pray that tonight you would just open our eyes and our hearts to see you for who you truly are. And God, help us to um, just learn how that we can reflect your character. God, thank you for your incredible love for us and your mercy toward us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. All right, so what is mercy? Well, simply stated, mercy is acting with compassion and forgiveness. And my throat is already dry. So I'm going to give you a minute to write that down. Mercy is acting with compassion and forgiveness. According to the Evangelical Dictionary of Theology, mercy is demonstrated most clearly by qualities such as compassion and forbearance. In a legal sense, mercy may involve pardon, forgiveness, or mitigation of penalties. In each case, mercy is experienced and exercised by one who has power over another person or by one from whom no kindness can be claimed. Thus, God may show mercy towards humans all of whom are ultimately under his authority, even though they have no direct claim in terms of behavior to merciful attitudes or actions. So in your reading this week on page 72, Jen laid out those three definitions for us that we introduced last week. If you remember, last week we said that justice is getting what we deserve, mercy is not getting what we deserve, and grace is getting what we do not deserve. And next week, Rebecca will be teaching on grace. So last week, Tricia talked about God's just nature. Paul tells us in the book of Romans that we all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And that we, the wages of sin is death. So that is what we deserve. That's the justice we deserve. And I loved what Jen said about that in our reading this week. She said, the mere fact that you are reading this book should tell you that justice has not been served at least not at your expense. Instead, we have all been shown mercy. So how is God merciful? First of all, God's mercy is his active compassion and kindness toward his creation. Psalm 145, 9 says, The Lord is good to all, and his mercy is over all he has made. So God is actively compassionate towards us. He doesn't just think kind thoughts and caring thoughts about us, but he is compassionate towards us, and he, he actively shows that. One of my favorite hymns is, Great is Thy Faithfulness. And I know that's a favorite hymn for a lot of people. And there's a line in the chorus that says, Morning by morning, new mercies I see. And that song has just been going through my mind all week as I've been been studying for this, and, and it reminded me of, um, well, first of all, it comes from Lamentations 3, 22 and 23. Let me read this verse for you. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. So growing up in my little church in Batesville, I had a Sunday school teacher who actually, she's now moved to Little Rock and goes to church here as well. Um, but I always think of her when I hear about this verse or hear this verse um, because when I was in Miss Kennedy's class, I was probably in like third grade or something, she gave each of us a little container and it had laundry detergent in it. And it was the Fresh Start laundry detergent. Anybody remember that? So, and she had written on there, Fresh Start. And she, that week we were talking about God's mercy and his forgiveness 
And she said, I want you to keep this as just a reminder for you that every day his mercies are new. No matter how much you've messed up that day before, you can always turn to him for a fresh start. And I held on to that thing for so many years. I probably still have it in a box somewhere at my house. Um, But I just, I love that little reminder that his mercies are new every morning. So consider for a minute, what are some of the ways that you have seen God's mercy? How has he been compassionate toward you? The second thing we see about his mercy is that God's mercy is his goodness towards those in misery and distress. When we think of God's mercy, we think of Jesus, and rightly so. Ephesians 2 tells us that we are, we're all dead in our sins, following our fleshly passions and desires. We are children of wrath. But God, being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. We were in misery and distress. And God showed compassion toward us by sending Jesus to rescue us from sin and death. So Jesus is the ultimate display of God's mercy. But even before God sent his son Jesus, he was merciful. We often think of the God of the Old Testament as the God of judgment and wrath. And the God of the New Testament as the God of love and mercy. But God's mercy is who he is. Right? So just like we've said about the other attributes, he's not more or less merciful at any time. He is merciful. That is who he is. He doesn't just show mercy, but he is merciful. A.W. Tozier said it this way, when Jesus died on the cross, the mercy of God did not become any greater. It could not become any greater, for it was already infinite. We get the odd notion that God is showing mercy because Jesus died. No. Jesus died because God is showing mercy. It was the mercy of God that gave us Calvary, not Calvary that gave us mercy. If God had not been merciful, there would have been no incarnation, no babe in the manger, no man on a cross, and no open tomb. I love that quote. With that in mind, I want us to take a look for a minute um, at the ways that we see God's mercy in the Old Testament. You see, throughout the Old Testament, we see God's mercy, and it continually points us forward to Jesus. In in our reading this week, Jen talked briefly about the mercy seat, but I want us to spend a few more minutes um, just talking about that. There's so much significance here that I don't want us to miss. So many of the practices of the Old Testament, they're really foreign to us. And if we don't slow down and try to understand them, then and understand the big picture, then they, they just kind of become a bunch of stories, or sometimes weird stories. And we'll miss the significance of what God is doing. And that's how I grew up. I learned all the Bible study, all the Bible stories, but I, I never saw that thread of how they all are one big story all pointing to Jesus. So let's zoom out for a minute, and here's the big picture of what's going on. And by the way, if you want to do any more study on this, Um, I want to recommend to you guys the website Got Questions. I don't know if you've looked at that before. It's just a really good, simple explanation for things that are in Scripture that you might be like, what are they even talking about when they say this? Because sometimes even in our teaching up here, we'll just jump to something, and it might be something you haven't studied in a while or read, and you can just go on Got Questions, and it's really good explanations. Um, In fact, I used that website to pull up this short overview for us and a little bit more detailed description about the Ark of the Covenant and the Mercy Seat. So here's the big picture. After God had delivered his people, the Israelites, out of slavery in Egypt, he made a covenant. It was a conditional covenant with them through his servant Moses. He promised good to them and their children for generations if they obeyed him and his laws. But he always warned of despair punishment and dispersion if they were to disobey. And so um, as a sign of his covenant, he had the Israelites make a box, and we're going to put a picture of this up there, according to his own design, in which to place the stone tablets containing the Ten Commandments. So the Ten Commandments go in this box. This box or chest was called an ark, and it was made of acacia wood overlaid with gold. The ark was to be housed in the inner sanctum of the tabernacle, in the desert, and eventually in the temple when it was built in Jerusalem. 
This chest is known as the Ark of the Covenant. And all of this is recounted for us in Genesis and Exodus, like the whole building up to this, but this is in Exodus, um, the details of this. Um, The real significance of the Ark of the Covenant was what took place involving the lid of the box known as the mercy seat. The term mercy seat comes from a Hebrew word meaning to cover, placate, appease, cleanse, cancel, or make atonement for. It was here that the high priest only once a year entered the Holy of Holies where the ark was kept and atoned for his sins and the sins of the Israelites. The priest sprinkled blood of a sacrificed animal onto the mercy seat to appease the wrath and anger of God for past sins committed. This was the only place in the world where this atonement could take place. The mercy seat on the ark was a symbolic foreshadowing of the ultimate sacrifice for all sin, the blood of Christ shed on the cross for the remission of sins. Just as there was only one place for the atonement of sins in the Old Testament, the mercy seat of the Ark of the Covenant, so there is only one place for atonement in the New Testament and current times, the cross of Jesus Christ. As Christians, we no longer look to the ark, but to the Lord Jesus himself, as the propitiation and atonement for our sins. And I love what Jen said about this. She said, gaze on the image and heed its lesson. Mercy exalts itself above judgment. Where the law would condemn, mercy triumphs. So how can we reflect his mercy to the world? A couple of years ago on our church podcast, I interviewed a man named John Blackman. And John... um, He's an elder here at Fellowship, and he serves on our staff. He is our pastor of, what do we call him? Pastor of operations, so he oversees a whole lot of things. But prior to coming on staff here at Fellowship, um, John served for almost 20 years in law enforcement. So he was in highway patrol, criminal investigation, that sort of thing. And that conversation that we had had on the podcast just really stuck with me. I remembered him talking about that being in law enforcement gave him the opportunity to, to understand more of God's justice and his mercy. And he had shared a story when I interviewed him that I wanted him to share with y'all. So I just pulled him aside on Sunday and asked if I could just video him for a minute and have him share this story with you guys. So we're going to play a short video and let him um, tell you this story from his time in law enforcement. She had her apron on where she worked at the Waffle House. Maybe start that over. And, uh, she was coming from work. I think we missed the I beginning. Pulled, I'll give you a perfect example. Okay. That's Once good. I pulled over a young lady, and uh, she, as a matter of fact, she had her apron on where she worked at the Waffle House. And uh, she was coming from work. I pulled her over because she didn't, her vehicle license had, had expired. And when I pulled her over and I I don't know, I spoke with her, she didn't have a seatbelt on. And I said, ma'am, you know, I'm, I'm Trooper Blackman with Arkansas State Police. The reason I stopped you is because your vehicle license has expired. And it was about six months. I mean, it was a long period of time. Mm-hmm. And I said, and I also noticed that you're not wearing your seatbelt. Is there a reason for that? Mm-hmm. And she said, no. Uh, I just got off work. I'm sorry. Mm-hmm. And she started tearing up immediately. Mm-hmm. Well, that happens all the time. Okay, when people are just trying to get out of tickets, they start to cry. And then, so you kind of become immune to mm-hmm. crying. <laughs> it's like, okay, yeah, whatever. I done right. <laughs> <laughs> you kind of become immune to it. Like, okay, that's somebody else trying to get out of the ticket. Mm-hmm. But hers was different. So I looked in the back seat, and she had two car seats. Oh, no children there, just two car seats. And I said, ma'am, do you have children? She said, yes, sir. And, uh, she said, sir, I don't know what else to do. Uh, she didn't have insurance. And she said, sir, I'm trying to work so I can get the money to pay for my tags. To get, in. But I can't get my tags until I get insurance, and insurance is so expensive. And she said, but I have to get my kids to school. I have to get to work. Uh, I don't know what else to do. And I felt so horrible for her. Mm. For one, uh, I've been there in a, in a different capacity. 
where when I was younger, I didn't have insurance either. And my dad wouldn't let me drive, but sometimes I would have to go to work, so I would have to drive, just praying I didn't get in an accident. But what if I had children? What if that, that just changes the entire dynamic? Mm -hmm. So I said, ma'am, <clears throat> I can't let you drive uh, because you don't, you know, and I'm, I'm supposed to tow this vehicle. I said, but what I'm going to do is I'm going to follow you to the house, all right? We're going to try to find a, someone that can provide a reasonable insurance rate for you. And I'm, I'm, I'm just going to give you a warning. Mm -hmm. She fell to pieces. She just boo-hooed. So I follow her home. I did know an insurance agent at the time that could that could help her, and we got her uh, you know, kind of hooked up with him, and she was very grateful. But all that to say, she deserved deserved justice. Her tags were way expired, mm -hmm. six months. Normally, we give somebody a break if it's one or two months. But six months is half a year; it's a long time. Mm -hmm. uh, she deserved ticket she deserved for me, me possibly to tow her vehicle but at that time I saw she needed some mercy mm -hmm. and I believe I never seen her again but I believe that just by me extending that mercy to her especially for her children her family uh, I felt like this sometimes the way that God views us mm -hmm. not sometimes all the time mm -hmm. and we rephrase it mm -hmm. it's all the time mm -hmm. Do we deserve justice? I mean, God's justice for us is hell. But he, he's an all-righteous and all-holy God. Mm -hmm. And he's done nothing that be good to us. Mm -hmm. But yet, we don't give him goodness back. Mm -hmm. We don't obey him. We fall short all the time. Sometimes, most of the time, willingly, we know. We choose it. We yeah. choose it. We mm -hmm. know that this is wrong before we do it. Mm -hmm. We know that this will grieve the heart of God before we do it, but we do it anyway. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then we cry out for mercy. And God is loving and he's full of grace and he's full of mercy. And he extends that mercy. Well, I really love that story, and sorry the volume wasn't great in there, the sound, but I think you could hear and just, I loved hearing John's heart in that and his compassion. And in that story, there were several ways that I feel like we can look at that and go, okay, I could see how John was reflecting God's mercy in that. So let's, let's just talk about those, a few observations there. First of all, he felt compassion toward the woman. He saw that she was genuinely in need and his heart was stirred with compassion. And so I think the first thing that we can observe is that as those who have been shown mercy, our hearts should be moved toward compassion for others. It begins with our hearts. Do we see others as God sees them? And do we look on others with compassion? And secondly, he not only felt compassion, but he acted in a way that showed mercy toward the woman. Showing mercy to others means that we seek to do good on their behalf in spite of what justice deserves. She deserved the justice of a ticket, but he showed her mercy by giving her a warning and then helping her find a way out of the situation to solve her problem. As a police officer, John had the opportunity to seek justice or to show mercy. And so how do we know when to act in which way? What situations call for justice and what situations call for mercy? James 4, 6 says that God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. We're not the judge of others' motives, but we, we want to operate with wisdom in that. The woman that John pulled over, she wasn't willfully opposing the law and trying to be disobedient. She truly needed help. The mercy John showed her was a reflection of God's mercy toward us. When we repent and turn to him, we are met with mercy and forgiveness. And then third, that warning was essentially forgiving her transgression. We show mercy when we forgive others as we have been forgiven. That can be challenging. What challenges you in forgiving others? Whether or not you like the person, 
whether or not they admit they were wrong. Or maybe they have a track record of disappointing or hurting you. When we struggle, though, to forgive others, could it be that we haven't fully grasped or maybe we've just lost sight of the magnitude of the mercy that's been shown to us in Christ? So I want to close by reading a parable in the book of Matthew. A parable is a story that Jesus told to illustrate a lesson. In Matthew 18, Peter asked Jesus, Lord, how often will my brother sin against me and I forgive him? As many as seven times? Jesus said to him, I do not say to you seven times, but 77 times. And then Jesus told this parable. Therefore, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who wished to settle accounts with his servants. When he began to settle, one was brought to him who owed him 10,000 talents. And since he could not pay, his master ordered him to be sold with his wife and children and all that he had and payment to be made. So the servant fell on his knees, imploring him, have patience with me and I will pay you everything. And out of pity for him, the master of that servant released him and forgave him the debt. But when that same servant went out, he found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred denarii and seized him. And seizing him, he began to choke him, saying, pay what you owe. So his fellow servant fell down and pleaded with him, have patience with me and I will pay you. He refused and went and put him in prison until he should pay the debt. When his fellow servants saw what had taken place, they were greatly distressed and they went and reported to their master all that had taken place. Then his master summoned him and said to him, you wicked servant, I forgave you all the debt, all that debt because you pleaded with me. And should you not have had mercy on your fellow servant? As I had mercy on you, and in anger his master delivered him to the jailers until he should pay all his debt. So also my heavenly Father will do to every one of you if you do not forgive your brother from your heart. As the ESV commentary points out, the two central points of the parable are first of all that the gift of salvation is immeasurably great, and second that unless a person is comparably merciful to others, A, God's mercy has not had its saving effect upon him, and B, he will be liable to pay the consequences himself. Well, this is interesting because that is my last page, and that is not my last page. Trisha, would you please bring me my last page? (laughs) I have no idea what I'm supposed to say. I've never had that happen. Oh, I gave you both copies. That's the same page. Awesome. We did have a teacher in Bloom a couple weeks ago get up here, and she had left all of her notes at work, all of them, and she still taught. She did really good. That's like my worst fear. So anyway, all right, as we look back on the ways that we can reflect God's mercy to others, those that we observed, think about your relationship with God and with others. I put a few questions for reflection on the back of your handout. And so let's look at those and and spend some time thinking about these this week. How do you see God's mercy in your life? Number two, ask yourself honestly, is my heart moved towards compassion for others or judgment with little compassion? For example, how do you react to that homeless person you see at the intersection? Do you think, why don't they get a job? Or they don't deserve my money or handout? Or do you consider that their life is really hard? There might be some mental illness there. Do you have compassion toward them? And do you, do you say, Lord, how can I pray for this person? How can I show them compassion? Third, to whom do you need to show mercy? How can you seek to do good on their behalf in spite of what justice deserves? We show mercy, for example, when we accept a person instead of trying to change them. Or we don't hold a grudge, but we forgive. I know I'm so thankful for the relationships in my life where people have mercy towards me because I know my words are not always kind, especially to those that are closest to me and especially when I'm stressed or tired or hangry. Anybody else? Yeah. So, and then last, who do you need to forgive as an act of mercy? And for that You may know even as I say it, or maybe you need to ask the Lord to show you, who do I need to forgive as an act of mercy? So God's will for us is to know his merciful nature and be transformed by the Holy Spirit to show mercy. We have been shown great 
mercy. Therefore, we respond by being merciful to others. Will you guys pray with me? Heavenly Father, we just thank you for your word. And God, it's just so humbling as we think about the incredible mercies that you have shown us. Lord, the gift of salvation in Jesus is the greatest mercy you could have ever given us. And Lord, even in our daily lives, there are so many things that we take for granted that are truly your mercies towards us. So God, I just pray that you would help us live with our eyes open to seeing all the ways that you love and care for us. And we just thank you for your goodness and your love and your mercy. In Jesus' name, amen.